Good morning. Welcome to the Swift Heroes Warm Up. My name is Lucy James. We are coming to you live from the Synesthesia Studios in Turin. Here with me this morning is Stefano Mandino. Hi, everyone. Hello, no, Lucy. Ciao, Steph. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks. It's a nice day and very glad to be here. It is a nice day, isn't it? And it yeah. is lovely to yeah. be here. Sometimes it's <laughs> nice to chat from live and, you know. Yeah, something we're not used to anymore. Yeah. Um, so Steph is the iOS tech lead for Synesthesia and our in-house iOS expert um, for Swift Heroes. So thank you for being able to join us. It's a pleasure for me. This morning. Um, we will, of course, be um, live next week as well, but from the Swift Hero Studios, as we bring you the full event, which we're very much looking forward to, um, over 20 speakers from around the globe, um, lots of hot Swift topics to be covered, lots um, and lots of treats in store. But for this morning, it's just a quick flavour of what to expect, and to give us that flavour, joining us live from Stockholm, we've got Bruno Rocha from Spotify. Hi, Bruno. Hi Lucy, hi Steph, it's really nice to be here. <laughs> Thank nice you so you. much. <laughs> Thank you. We're really glad you could join us. Um, and I see that you've got a nice day over there in Sweden. Yeah, it's uh, getting warm in these days, so you're getting nice and warm. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Have you guys spoken before? Do you know each other? I guess it's uh, the first time, but it's a uh, really nice pleasure yeah. to, to meet someone from, you know, from Spotify. And, and I'm really, um, w I can't wait for, to hear what they had to say and I, I want to, you know, get, get to know what they're doing over there. <laughs> they can't wait to get into yeah. it. <laughs> um, I'm going to steal a couple of minutes with you first though, Bruno, if I can, um, because this is such a nice opportunity for us to get to know our speakers before, um, before a big event. Tell me a little bit about how long you've been with Spotify and you know, some of the work that you're doing over there with Spotify. Sure. So I started working at Spotify a year ago. And the thing that I work on is a team that is focused, let's say, on the architecture of the app. So my purpose is to develop tools to make it easy for the rest of the feature developers to develop their features. So we work with things like dependency injection, uh, the navigation of the app, so how the entry points work and so on. And how's that going? How's Pretty that nice. been for the last year? Has that project been going well for you? Has that, has, how's it been working with that new team? Yeah, it, it's been awesome. And recently, specifically, we have been doing some new approaches, some evolutions that we wanted to do to the architecture, which is in fact what sparked me to do this talk in the first place. <laughs> okay, well, we'll come on to your talk in just a minute. But before we do that, I can't resist the opportunity. Obviously, Spotify is so well known. I'm a big fan, can't live without a Spotify playlist. Yeah, me too. Yeah, same. <laughs> um, have you got any, I don't know, inside news, any, any exciting things you can tell us about what's happening at Spotify at the moment? Sure. So. So I don't technically have the clearance to give the details on what we're trying to do and so on, but my team is working on some really cool new projects that we might want to share with the community in the, in the future. So, so oh, I'm I really like excited that. for that. I think it's going to be really nice. That's a good teaser, Bruno. Well done. That was excellent. Can't wait for that. New course. Spotify things that we might be interested in. Yes, we are. <laughs> we're interested. <laughs> Um, Steph, you've got some questions about Bruno's presentation. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could just uh, give some, I don't know, heads up uh, about your, your talk. I mean, I, I know you're talking about uh, um, uh, great architect, big architectures and how to, to scale from, from small to big. So uh, I, I was wondering if you could just give some heads up, some, you know, teasing. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so Steph, I, I work with different apps of very different sizes, all the way from apps that just have one screen and are super simple to a massive application like Spotify. And something that I noticed is that every time you reach that point when you say, okay, I need to evolve this application and make it scale and so on, the larger the application is, the harder it is to make this jump. And the problems that you need to do to make this jump, they're completely different. And what I want to share in this talk is basically what jump you need to do to reach an app the size of Spotify. But I also want to share what this evolution looks like in the first place. Like, how do you reach this point? Because I could just say, okay, this is what Spotify looks like and you can do it, but 
it doesn't serve much purpose if you don't understand why do you need to do those things in the first place. So I like to go with a little bit of this evolution and then use this to share how Spotify uses its architecture and so on. And I think it's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I, I can't wait to, um, to, to see that. And uh, um, I don't know, from a developer point of view, um, what, what are the, um, the most common mistakes uh, uh, you, you have found out uh, while developing such, uh, such architectures. I, I don't know, can you, can you share with us something about that? I mean, uh, the, the worst uh, mistake you, you could do while scaling your architecture. That's very interesting because there are trade-offs in everything. And when you, when you ask that, the first thing that came to my mind is that when people that try to develop architectures, they try to predict what's going to happen in the future. And in the end, they make something that is super rigid, that I, it needs to work like this because we want to have something that is massively scalable and supports a trillion users and so on. Why would in, in reality, you have like 10 users and you have one screen. So why did you do that in the first place? You never needed it. And the problem is that it becomes super rigid to make some changes and so on. So I think the biggest mistake someone could do is creating an architecture that is super rigid and unflexible because they're trying to solve problems that you don't have, basically. I can't agree more with that. I mean, <laughs> I, it's something I, I've experienced myself uh, and then, uh, I mean, I've I'm, I'm been developing, developing from, I guess, 10 years now. And uh, uh, it's something I, 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 it's a mistake I, I made in the first years and then slowly try to, um, to achieve some more uh, uh, light architecture. So I totally agree with you. And uh, I don't know, what's your, um, what, what pattern uh, of developing architectures would you recommend? I mean, what, I, I know there's not a single answer, a simple answer for this, but uh, if you were to choose a, a pattern for developing an architecture, what would you choose? Sure. I think if I try to figure out a pattern without giving a name specifically, but the most important thing for me is to have clear separation of concerns. So, so that's not really a pattern, but just applying solid in general. So I try to make things that don't do a lot of stuff at once because I like to separate them into, and compose them into components and then yeah. test those components individually. I think if you do that, then you can build any architecture and it's always going to work. Okay, I, I guess uh, I guess I, I agree with that, and it's uh, I mean it's always some nice to, to apply solid and, and dry uh, also for from my point of view it's uh, totally agreeable. By the way, uh, for all the guys um, that are actually uh, listening to this, uh, please feel free to uh, write your own question for Bruno in the in the YouTube chat, please, so that we can ask him. And uh, if you have anything about uh, is to talk about architecture so we can, we can share details with him if you, if, you, if you like. Exactly right. I think one person's already commented, good luck for the conference. So we're off to a good start there with the comments. <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely, if there's, um, if there's questions um, or, or comments. Uh, or yeah, it's, uh, it's Antoine Van der Lee, so it's uh, a speaker himself. Oh, it's, uh, <laughs> previous speaker. From yeah, previous speaker from, from the first edition. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but yeah, please, if you've got questions to ask to Bruno or indeed to, to Steph. Um, no, no, please, Bruno. It's uh, <laughs> way more qualified than me. Don't worry about that. Um, post them here in, in YouTube and we'll, we'll work our way through them. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, what what can, can we ask? And, and what about, uh, I don't know, do you have some more... Uh, uh, one, one thing that it's so, always a, a problem with me is choosing the, the right approach to dependencies and to uh, especially package managers and uh, um, how can we integrate things inside our project. Can you give us your, your point of view? I mean, I had trouble with CocoaPods, with Cartage, with, uh, uh, with Swift, package, with Swift package Manager, SPM, sorry. Uh, always a trouble. Uh, what, uh, what is your experience with that and what would you recommend? Recommend. That's a very interesting topic. And I think what I have in mind is that this differs depending on the size of a project. So now that I'm working on Spotify and the company that I worked previously, we had a pretty big application. So we weren't using Xcode directly or Cocoa Pods or someone. We are using Buck and Bezo now. Okay. So we had our own monorepo build system. 
And in the monorepo build system, it is assumed that you own all of your dependencies. So, so you cannot import something like CocoaPods. I mean, you can, but you have to abstract it. That's what I mean. Okay. And lately I've been, I have much of the opinion that I like doing things natively. I don't like using dependencies unless it's very necessary. For something that is super useful, like cartography for, for constraints, I think that's an awesome framework. Or promise kit, another awesome framework. But but in medium size apps where you would normally use Cocoa Ports or SPM or so on, I just really like using Cocoa Ports for iOS. But recently I've been working a lot with SPM for personal projects. And I really like how it evolved. I don't know if you can use it very well for iOS. I think they still need to make some evolutions for that, especially in regards to resources and so on. Yeah. I think they added those capabilities recently, but I don't know if someone really tried to make an iOS app with that. But I, but I think SPM is super cool. And I hope that they evolve it in a way that you can use it for actual iOS development, if that's not the case already. But if that's not the case, then I had great success using Cocoa Pods, even for modularization stuff. So if you have an app and you're modularis modularizing it on your own, I used to do private Cocoa Pods folders in my project and treat them like Cocoa Pods dependencies, but, but they are not. It, I was just using it as a way to easily make a, an alternate framework. Yeah. And I think that worked pretty well. I thought that was awesome. Okay, yeah, I've seen that uh, as well, like development pods inside your, uh, your local, uh, local storage uh, folders. Yeah, I think it's yeah, exactly. uh, something I've seen. Uh, we have some questions from the, from the audience, and the first one uh, um, is, uh, uh, have you uh, used uh, SwiftUI in, uh, in Spotify uh, yet or, or not? Uh, so we don't have iOS 13 yet, but we do have widgets. So, so yes, there is actual Swift UI code in Spotify, but I don't think there is going to be any Swift UI code for the actual Spotify app okay. in, in a while, especially mostly because we don't support the iOS version for it. Yeah, it's a, a common issue, I guess. Uh, we we <laughs> in our agency also have the, the same problem. We can not use it for uh, dependency issues. And um, you, you mentioned uh, PromiseKit uh, before as a, as a dependency, and we have a, um, a related question. Um, they're, they're asking if you uh, ever use the reactive programming and uh, if you uh, yet use Combine in your, uh, in your projects. Uh, what's your, uh, your opinion about that? Yeah, so we have a little project here today where we're actually trying to use Combine for it. And it's, it's been a bit of a challenge because Combine is very complicated, in my opinion. But, but it's kind of working pretty well. And so we are all in a stage where we're trying to learn reactive stuff and so on, so we can use Combine. I think, I think it's pretty cool. I did a few SwiftUI personal projects okay. and I really liked how all the states work and how you publish information. I thought it was pretty cool. When I worked with RX products in the past, it was a very complicated experience because it was super hard. But now that you have actual native support for it, then I think it could be, could be a nicer thing. So we are trying to do things with Combine, and I think it's gonna gonna be nice. Yeah, let's hope that uh, they're bringing us some more uh, evolution with uh, next step up. I don't know. I hope we we can have a more solid and. Uh, uh, stable framework because I, I had some issues in the past uh, between each release of uh, of combine with uh, with Xcode 11 they had some issues yeah. with some components but it's uh, yeah it's really great to finally have some reactive programming uh, native uh, inside uh, the the Apple ecosystem and not relying to something external like we used to do so yeah I, I agree with you and uh, uh, next question is. Uh, um, there's two follow-up questions actually yeah, about okay. um, Swift UI just here. Um, one is okay. Um, Do you think that Swift UI is ready to production, um, or besides the, the limits uh, for the for the SDK? But what do you think about that? Okay, uh, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. I have a personal opinion about Swift UI, which is Swift UI is really nice if you're trying to build like a very simple view and you just want to display stuff that it's super easy to, to make it happen and it's awesome. 
But if you're trying to develop an actual app that is super complex, then I think purely using Swift UI is, is kind of complicated right now. I don't know if it's going to improve in the future. Honestly, I'm not paying too much attention to it. But uh, when I tried, it was pretty complicated. So what I think personally is a great combination is that if I made a, an app today, I think I would use Swift UI for the views themselves, but all the navigation part and this business logic stuff that would be normally complicated, I would still use UIKit for it. So I would merge them together. I wouldn't use Swift UI for, for like 100% Swift UI in a project. I think I would do a hybrid sort of thing. Okay, and uh, <laughs> there's an odd topic inside here, and uh, I mean, it's related to another question from a colleague of mine that is asking, uh, um, did you ever uh, have any issues debugging uh, uh, reactive stuff like Combine uh, or uh, reactive programming in general? It's something that it's uh, uh, known to be uh, usually uh, hard to, to debug. Did, did you ever uh, experience something like that? I, think I mean, it's, hard it's, to develop, a, it's an odd question because they, they ask it. Mm, what, mm, the first time I had a talk, uh, the, they asked me the same question and I was able to, to provide a, um, a solid answer uh, and a, a convincing answer to that. So that we are kind of asking that to, to everyone we're speaking with. <laughs> What's your opinion about yeah. that? Well, I think Combine is complicated in every single way, actually. So yeah, it's, it's difficult to debug. But it's also difficult to write in the first place. But it's because it's a, it's a different paradigm. So you need to actually understand how it works. And, and, and yeah, I don't know if I have a specific case where I can say, oh, this, this was difficult to, to debug. No, the, the, the because thing is usually that when you use Rx Swift or Combine or whatsoever with Reactive, since they're wrapping logic inside its components, your stack traces yeah. begin to start to, to get really, uh, really big and uh, uh, gets hard to, to debug. So it's just, uh, yes, it's uh, uh, m my opinion in that is that, uh, yeah, it gets hard to, to debug mm -hmm. if you write it uh, um, not in the proper way, but usually if you are using uh, uh, publishers or observable in an Rx Swift, uh, they, they get, uh, you know, they, they get, uh, uh, you, don't, you don't get the need to debug so often. Sometimes, yes, you, sometimes you do, but not so often. So it's just a, a, a big uh, question we have in, in here in, in our uh, company to how people debug uh, reactive programming. Yeah, so, so I think this is, this is a good place to talk about what we are talking about before and where you co actually try to compose stuff. Because I totally understand if you get a combined publisher and you just start stacking the modifiers, then there's something else like, I have no idea what happened here because the framework is super magical. Yeah. So I think what I'm trying to do now is we're trying, we're building a framework that is based on Combine and we have these sort of issues where not that it is difficult to debug, but in code reviews, we have no idea what's going on because it's so complex. Like, okay, I think this works, but why? Yeah. I just see a bunch of modifiers and I know it's magical and somehow it works. So we're trying to actually break this down in more manageable pieces. So someone who's reading this can actually see, okay, this part is going to do this and this part's going to do this. And I think this is, this would help with debugging because you know what, what you're going to be expecting in each of these components. Yeah, totally. Totally agree with that. Lucy, do you have some, some more follow up? Well, yeah, I was going to actually just give us a bit of a breather from the super technical questions if, if you guys don't mind um, and also a quick reminder to to everybody watching that you can um you can post questions into the youtube chat um, and we will work through them as as we're live here with with bruno um but i wanted to ask you a question actually you know bruno you moved to to sweden from brazil just before this this famous pandemic um started um, obviously, remote working, digital conferences are themes that are, you know, are hot on everybody's minds. Um, and I wanted to ask what your experience has been like, um, you know, remote working from a new country with a new company. Um, and yeah, if you can just give us like, a, you know, a bit of, bit of your experience, basically. Sure. Uh, there's a story that I tell everyone, which is when I joined Spotify, I only stayed one day in the office. <laughs> so I went to the office, I got my stuff, and I met my team and so on, worked there for the day. 
And then on the next day, I, I went to the office and there was no one. And then, uh, oh my God, what happened? And then I saw my email and there's this like announcement from HR that happened in the middle of the uh, in the night because they were in the New York time zone. They say, oh, we're, we're going to stay home because of Corona and so on and so forth. And I have been home ever since. So I've only been to the office once. Huh. In regards to staying at home and remote work, I think it varies from, from person to from person. In my case, because I moved to a different country, I would really like to be able to go to the office because I actually want to meet people that work here and so on. Or like if you just move to a, I'm going to say company, but, but if you just move to a country, uh, you want to be involved in a country and so on. And I think this applies a little bit if you change jobs as well. So I personally not a big fan of remote work. But I can say that it's definitely nice to be able to wake up in a reasonable hour and not have to commute and so on. So yeah. there, are, there are pros and cons. Sure. And I mean, I, I personally think that one of the pros that we have is that we can, we can do an event like this um, ad hoc. You know, we can, we can meet together. Obviously, we're, we're together here at a safe distance. Yeah, <laughs> um, but we can, we can speak and meet like this, anticipating next week's conference. And, um, and that's a really nice opportunity for yeah. all of us, something we wouldn't be able to do if we had to do it in, in presence. Um, so I think that's a nice feature. What's your year been like in terms of conferences and events, Bruno? Have you been able to take up a lot more opportunities, get involved in more community um, projects with, uh, you know, with, re with being remote, remotely connected? That's an interesting thing because I actually think in my case, it was somehow the other way because when the pandemic started, I noticed that the community as a whole started to win the down a little bit. Because as you know, we stopped having the conferences, we stopped having the, the, the communities that we have. But closer to the end of the year, we slowly started ramping that back up. So we started having the remote conferences and the remote talks and so on, and then started being nice. So if you ask how my year was, I would say, well, the, everything was winded down. So I was also winded down, but now we're winning back up. So I'm personally working on some personal projects. And it was nice to stay home, so because cool. after I finished working, I could directly jump into that. Okay, um, <laughs> I see. Our most recent question is very charmingly phrased about about why we don't have a, a camera specifically on me. It's because <laughs> it, it's because um, we're more interested in the technical conversation that's taking place. <laughs> um, and uh, so, thank you very much for your question. Um, but um, if there's any other questions for Bruno specifically, uh, no, sorry, I, I, I missed one question because I, I, okay. I misread it. So the, another question, a technical one for you, is yeah. that. Uh, uh, how would you analyze if a framework is ready to production? Jesus. Uh, <laughs> how do I know if a framework is ready for production? Well, well, when I look into a framework, I'm not necessarily looking if it's production ready, but if it solves my problem. And maybe you could just deduce it from that. So I want to solve a problem. And I'm going to download it and I'm going to see if it solves my problem. If it solves my problem, I'm going to use it. But what I can say is that I personally don't like using third party frameworks too much unless it's a huge win, like cartography. But that's a personal opinion. It doesn't really mean that, that you shouldn't do the, this kind of stuff. That's a, to be honest, I don't really know how to answer this question. How do you know stuff if the framework is ready for production? Well, um, I think we are uh, um, we are involved in different projects. I work uh, on many uh, many projects at the same time. Uh, while I think you you work on a on a single big project or big co big collection of projects. So, in my opinion, uh, where I uh, jump from a project to another, uh, I usually choose frameworks uh, from from GitHub and from dependencies for my project if they have a, a very high number of stars on GitHub because it's an usually oh, nice uh, in indicator uh, that gives me the, the idea if I can use that and also see how many, uh, not how many issues open are because uh, usually issues means simply uh, feature requests from you know the, the maintenance of the of the libraries, but also uh, how much is maintained a, a library and when the latest uh, release was. So it's yeah, uh, an true. indicator for me to to decide whether to use or not a framework. 
And uh, uh, anyway, I'm not using more than 10 dependencies in my project, which is a, a big number for some, but for agencies, I, I guess it's reasonable, in my opinion. Yeah, th that's a good point that I, that I forgot. Uh, I definitely also look at how active the GitHub page is. So if there is actually someone maintaining it, if there is not uh, like 100 pull requests that are ignored, then, then these are good indicators. That, that's true, that's very true. Yeah, and, and one thing I, I, I would like to uh, encourage everyone to do is that is to contribute to, to repositories uh, if you can, if, you're, uh, uh, if your company allows it uh, to, to do that, to uh, please contribute to the open source uh, community and uh, make pull requests to the, the maintainers because it's really important. Sometimes it's something that you don't want to do because you're afraid to, to do mistakes, but please do that and help the community grow with every uh, kind of project you, you may be interested in. So please do that. Uh, other question is, uh, uh, I think it's the, the yeah. last one. Um, when a project is highly coupled and there is a lot of uh, spaghetti code, what's your approach uh, to start refactor? Nice one, refactoring. That's, okay. Yeah, that, that's a nice one. It's it's a difficult one to, to answer because this, this is going to vary from project to project. But as a generic answer, what we usually try to do in the past, like me personally and, and in different companies, is that if you try if you define your new architecture, like how you want things to work from now on, you kind of leave the rest as it is. Because if you try to change that, you're gonna waste a lot of time and it's gonna be super complicated. You may succeed, but it's probably not going to be worth your time. So what you're trying to do is, once you have your new architecture, you work on the new pieces using this new architecture. But if someone happens to need to work on this legacy code that is now obsolete, then that person should pick that code and try to adapt it to the new format. And you do that little by little until your entire project is is into your new format or, or someone. I think that's the thing that works the most because the times that we actually try to, oh, let's get the entire project and change everything. It, it was always a really bad experience because there's a lot of stuff and, and you don't know the problems that you're going to have when you try to do that change. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's us. Do you have any more questions for Bruno? No, I'm, I'm fine. I can't wait to, okay. to hear his talk next week. Perfect. Bruno, I've got one last question for you. Um, yeah. What other speakers are you looking forward to hearing from at Swift Heroes next week? I really like to, to hear Vincent's talk. I think it's going to be really nice. There's a lot of talks about Swift UI that I think it's going to be really interesting. I'm going to watch everything. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So thank you so much for, for having the time to spend with us this morning. It's been a real pleasure to chat with you, get to know you, and get that little taste of what's yeah. coming next week. Um, we're very much looking forward to your presentation. We are, of course, looking forward to the whole event um, taking place next week. So it's one week to go until Swift Heroes. Tickets still available. Um, all of the warm-up that we're looking forward to next week, we're going to start putting our T-shirts on. Yeah. Yeah. They've arrived in the office, I believe, the T-shirts, haven't they? Yeah, but they're still hidden, so we haven't yeah, seen them. Yeah, super secret. Big surprise. Um, okay. And, uh, yeah, we'll be looking forward to, uh, to seeing you, Bruno, and all the rest of our speakers. You'll be with us, won't you, Steph? Yeah, I think I'm going to follow the, the speakers and help them out uh, during the conference. Perfect. This year. Perfect. So we'll all see each other next week and look forward to seeing all of you at home to join us back here uh, live from Turin next week for Swift Heroes. Okay.